Alrighty, that uh, does look to be about that time, doesn't it? Uh, I'd like to thank everyone for coming out today for the history pre-law uh, talk from Dr. Gary Gregg on Christian leadership and the moral imagination. Uh, as we begin, let me give you a little background about uh, Dr. Gregg. He is the director of the McConnell Center for Political Leadership at the uh, University of Louisville. We won't hold that against him. Uh, and where he's been there for 10 or 12 years, 12 years, I think, uh, for a dozen years. He holds a uh, Ph.D. in political science from Miami of Ohio, where he's an expert on the presidency. He also delves into political fiction, not political fiction, but fiction, uh, writing a series of children's books uh, on the moral on importance of the moral imagination and mythical tales. He is also the co-editor of several books, um, a non-fiction book called Vital Remnants, which I've actually assigned to some of my classes in the past. So some of you here may have read some of the essays out of this book. Uh, another one on George Washington called uh, Patriot Sage. Another book on why the Electoral College matters, why it's important. And a whole host of other articles and book reviews and, and other learned journals. So uh, at, without much further ado, I'll turn the floor over to Dr. Gary Gregg. Thank you, uh, Dr. Coleman. Thank you all for uh, coming out today. It's a pleasure to be here at uh, Kentucky Christian, my first uh, visit, visit to the campus. And uh, I've had a good time so far. Um, some of us have been in class earlier together, had a little uh, crazy lecture. Mark went to lunch instead of coming to the lecture, <laughs> but nonetheless, uh, the rest of us had a good time, Mark. it was. They'll tell you about it, what you missed. Um, Anyway, I appreciate Dr. Coleman inviting me uh, here here today. Um, he is uh, uh, a former pseudo student of mine. Um, he told the first class he didn't really take any of my classes or anything like that. He's too smart for me, but uh, but I paid him to be my graduate assistant to get get through school. So if you don't like Dr. Coleman, it's my fault, I guess. Uh, for that, I helped him get him through school. But uh, he uh, he's the guy I come to when I want to know something about American history. So uh, I, I suggest. Uh, he's a great great resource to have on this campus. Uh, I'm going to stick uh, kind of close to a text uh, today since we are being uh, being filmed. Uh, and someone may eventually want to watch this, I suppose, uh, at some point. Um, when I was thinking about what we were uh, what I was going to talk about today, um, I ran across this story, a little anecdote, and it's contained in a memoir by a man named Russell Kirk. Russell Kirk was um, a thinker, a historian, a writer in the uh, 20th century and one of my great heroes. And in his memoir, he recounts how in, uh, during one of his trips to Britain, he ran across this guy named Paul Roche, and he was old friends with Paul. And Paul came up to him one day excitedly and said that he had figured out the key to reforming the British parliamentary system. And he was very excited. This is going to fix the political problems of Great Britain. And so Dr. Kirk recounts, uh, recounts what uh, Paul Roche said to him like this. He said, quote, He would require that there be appointed to advise each cabinet minister some competent poet. The minister would be expected to listen to his poet, whether or not upon serious reflection the minister finally should accept the poet's counsel, and thereby the minister's folly would be diminished somewhat. Now think about that for a moment. How odd it is, isn't it, to think about putting a man or a woman of action, dealing in the real world with real money and making real decisions, alongside a poet. Imagine, keep this in mind, maybe a picture in your imagination here with me today of maybe that, that poet in a black turtleneck of some sort and probably black everything, um, cigarette maybe in his uh, fingers, um, I don't know, a cup of, cup of cappuccino, perhaps, um, staining his little goatee. Um, and imagine, uh, keep this guy in mind, and imagine him following around his political leader, maybe whispering occasionally in his ear some pretty words, um, walking around uh, the Capitol building uh, and the like. And I'm going to come back to it. It's a very odd, uh, a very odd picture, I think. Uh, and we'll come back to it as we... Uh, uh, as we go along, and then uh, wonder whether some of our political candidates might uh, might not offer this as part of their platform. Well, what I want to speak to you today is not about being poets, not that you might be poets, but I want to speak about leadership. 
When I looked at uh, the website of, uh, of your uh, college, I looked at the uh, university, I looked at the motto. And part of the motto says that you exist, quote, to educate students for Christian leadership. To educate students for Christian leadership. It's in that spirit that I want to talk to you today and offer some remarks. I've been studying leadership for a dozen years or, or more. Uh, I've been teaching leadership courses at the University of Louisville and my McConnell Scholars uh, for those dozen years. And one way we could approach this is I could give you a laundry list of, of lessons. And uh, you're taking notes. Have you taken any notes yet? Not yet? Uh, no, I haven't said anything worth taking notes yet, but you will. But I, I, could, ta- I could give you, you know, okay, point one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. I could do a laundry list of, of lessons. But that's not going to get us anywhere because uh, you're not going to remember all of those. So I want to boil it down into one basic lesson, and I want to talk about it. I want to reflect on it. I want to try to inhabit your minds uh, with it a little bit. And that's to juxtapose two words, imagination and leadership. Two words very seldom, very seldom found uh, together. What I want to argue is that not only should they be closely linked, but they are closely linked in very essential ways. And if we think about it, if we think about it, we will become better leaders, I think. We will understand leadership better. We will be able to critique our leaders, whether it is in the church or here on campus or it is in our political world, um, all the better. And particularly, I want to talk about what Edmund Burke called the moral imagination. Edmund Burke, if you don't know who Burke was, have you gotten to Burke yet in your British politics class? If you are British history. Uh, Edmund Burke was a, an 18th century parliamentarian, member of parliament, born in Ireland, but he was a member of parliament, represented uh, the district of Bristol in, uh, in, in Britain. Edmund Burke wrote a book called Reflections on the Revolution in France, which was one of the most important books in the history of Western civilization. Absolutely essential. Edmund Burke is the man, the man we can credit with saving Great Britain, saving the Anglo world from the evils of the French Revolution. Very, very important. Sir Walter Scott, uh, when he talked about Burke, he said that he blew his trumpet. He blew his trumpet. I may have know a story from longer ago. And the walls of the, of the revolution came tumbling down in Britain. This is what he said. This is one sentence, but it's a deep sentence. So bear with me. Listen to me uh, carefully uh, for one sentence, and then you can drift off again after this. This is from Burke's Reflections on the Revolution in France. All the decent drapery, he's talking about the French revolutionaries here and their philosophy and what's going on. All the decent drapery of life is to be rudely torn off. All the superadded ideas furnished from the wardrobe of a moral imagination, which the heart owns and the understanding ratifies. I'll keep coming back to this because it is hard to grasp it all at once which the heart owns and the understanding ratifies as necessary to cover the defects of our naked, shivering nature and to raise it to dignity in our estimation or to be exploded as ridiculous, absurd, and in an antiquated fashion. Now, Furnished from a wardrobe of the moral imagination. What on earth does that mean? Furnished from a wardrobe of the moral imagination. If you are in your minds right now thinking, I have not a clue, I don't know what he's talking about, and uh, boy, I'm I'm sorry I came over here today. I should have stayed away from the library. Um, I understand you. I sat for years in lectures like this, listening to people that I respected talk about the moral imagination, and I squirmed in the back thinking, I'm the only person in this room who doesn't have a clue what's going on here. What does that mean? You know, and it's like, um, 
kind of like it, you know those lizards that you, uh, uh, you you grab a hold of, but if you grab a hold back end, they, they can detach their tail and skip away. You think you got them, and then they get away. That's what the moral imagination is with me. This wardrobe of the moral imagination. For years, I try to grab at it, and I think I'd get it. I think I'd get a little grasp of it, and then it would slip off. I said, "Well, oh, I don't have a clue about this," but I knew it was important. Because Edmund Burke wrote about it as if it was important. I have great respect for Burke. But lots of people in the 20th century would come along and pick this up, this moral imagination stuff, people that I deeply respected. And so I stuck to it, I stuck at it, I kept coming back to it until I think I figured a few things, a few things out uh, that I want to share uh, today. So I want to talk about this moral uh, imagination with you today. And we can't go into the entire... Um, it's deep stuff, and I can't go into all of it, um, but I want to talk about this moral imagination and perhaps its essential link with uh, leadership. My own eureka moment on this, when it really sort of crystallized for the first time and I got it, was when I read for the second time, for the second time, if you don't read books more than once, as C.S. Lewis said, you haven't read them at all. You know, he'd say, he never wanted to hear if you'd say, have you read, oh yeah, I read that. He never wanted to hear that. He said, I'd rather hear you, you say, no, I've never read that, and I'm meaning to at some point, because there's hope for you. If you said, I've read that book, and you think you've, you're done, there's no hope for you, Lewis said. And I'll tell you, this is true, and I didn't, I didn't want to believe it either, because I'm not smart enough to read fast enough uh, to just read books and read them over again. But his, his, Lewis's insight is this. If you read a novel, if you read a novel, go on, folks, if you read a novel... Um, the first time you read it, you're all caught up in the drama. You're caught up in the story. You're caught up in what's going to happen next. And so you miss lots of the lessons, the nuance, the meaning. Make sense? There's a book that um, is mandatory reading in my classes of, on leadership called All the King's Men. Ever heard of it? By again, Robert Penn Warren. Ever heard of him? How many of you are from Kentucky? A good many of you, a big portion of you. Robert Penn Warren was Poet Laureate of the United States. Robert Penn Warren lived in Guthrie, Kentucky. He's one of the most important literary figures in our history. You should know him. You should read him. You should read All the King's Men. It is a fabulous, fabulous novel. I will tell you, my students read it in my leadership classes. Every single class we've ever done it, it comes out, it, we've done it in, those students come out every year saying it's their favorite book of all the books they've ever read. It's fabulous, fabulous stuff, deep stuff. It's all about political intrigue and drama and um, all kinds of terrible things. If, if you want to live your life, you know, you don't want to do terrible things, but you want to live it by, you know, reading about people smoking and terrible things like that. It's a good book to do that. It was written in the, you know, written in the 50s, so. All the King's Men, Robert Penn Warren. There is a moment in the novel. I missed it the first time I went through it. It hit me the second time like a ton of bricks. There is a moment when there's a lead, the lead character named Jack Stanton. And Jack Stanton's job is to change another man's mind. Or Jack, Jack Burden, I'm sorry, is to change another man's mind, who is Dr. Stanton. Jack Burden. Jack Burden needs to change Dr. Stanton's mind to get him to do something he doesn't want to do. In the end, he does. He convinces him to do it. And the great political figure who's modeled after Huey Long, uh, Willie Stark, great brutal Machiavellian political leader, when, he, when uh, Jack Burden came to him and said, I got it done, Dr. Stanton will do what you want. He said, how'd you do it? How'd you do it? You know, what, what'd you do? Did you bribe him? He said, no, I didn't bribe him. He said, did you, did you, uh, what, did you threaten him? You know, all right, cool. You threatened him? Got, you, got him what he wanted? No. He said, no, I didn't threaten him. He said, what did, how did you do it? And he said, I changed the pictures in Dr. Stanton's mind. Simple as that. I want you to think about that for a minute. I changed the pictures in Dr. Stanton's mind. He actually says in Dr. Stanton's head. This moment, the second time reading this and picking this line up, the moral imagination stuff of Edmund Burke, of Russell Kirk, of, of Coleridge and Blake and Babbitt, 
all came crashing down on me, and I came to understand a bit. And part of what I've come to understand from this, that it is not always cold, calculating reason that governs our lives. It is very often not reason that governs our lives, but the pictures that we carry around in our heads. And that's what I want to talk about today with you. I've become convinced over time now, as I've thought about this, as I've looked at this, as I've delved in, as Dr. Coleman was telling you, writing um, some young adult novels of my own, I've become very much convinced that we are sad or we are happy, we are well-adjusted or we are outcasts, we are Christian or we are pagan, largely because of the pictures that we carry around in our heads. They are essential to who we are. The pictures that are with you right now are essential to who you are. And we all carry them around as sort of baggage that we picked up over time from lots of different places. From parents, from teachers, from music, from church, from Sunday school, from loved ones, from movies, from classmates, from books. And we Christians are governed by a series of very powerful images, very powerful pictures that we have collected. Images of other Christians, Images of, well, images spurred by our Lord himself. Did he not teach in pictures? Did he not give us stories and pictures of mustard seeds and of empty tombs and of fishers of men and of the sacrificial love of God hanging from a cross? But back to my more general point. What these pictures that inhabit our imaginations, what do they mean? What do I mean when I say they govern our lives? I wrote down, what did, what did I write on your piece of, on your notepad? Uh, <clears throat> imagination rules the world, Napoleon. Imagination rules the world. Napoleon Bonaparte said that. For several years, I thought I invented that phrase. It's a pretty cool phrase. And it really sums up, when I wrote that on your paper, I said, this sums up everything I'm going to say today. Because imagination rules your life. When I was, uh, first wrote my first novel and I was traveling around, visiting people, talking about it, hawking it shamelessly, um, I would do it. My talk, I called Imagination Rules the World. And I had a big a dragon on a, on a board and behind me, and, and I put that in the cross. Until one day I was reading a book, and it says, Imagination Rules the World. And I said, what? I looked at the footnote, and it said, Napoleon Bonaparte, and, I, and, a, and, a, and a place where it was. I said, hold, I stole it someplace. Um, in my imagination, you see, I was a brilliant creative, uh, uh, created a great line. Anyway, Bonaparte, now I want you to think about that. Napoleon said that. Napoleon, not a nerdy professor like me, not a novelist. Napoleon right, who conquered half of Europe or so. He didn't say guns rule the world, didn't say cannons rule the world, didn't say politics or politicians or economics rules the world. He said imagination rules the world. We can't get any further than the pictures in our heads allow us to go. We can't do anything that the pictures in our heads tell us that we can't. And so you might now see, I hope, the genius, a little bit, of Dr. Kirk's friend, who claimed we could reform our politics by infusing poets into the process as advisors to our leaders. Our political leaders are governed, just like we are, and no less than we are, by the pictures that they carry around in their heads and the quality of their imagination. It was a diabolic a diabolic imagination, diabolic pictures that made possible Nazi rule. 
It was what we might call the idyllic imagination. If you want to talk about that, we can a little bit later. It was the idyllic imagination that made possible the terrors of the French Revolution and the awful, awful excesses of modern communism. Think of the difference, and I'm not taking sides on either one of these, but just think of the difference between a political figure who, in his mind, in his mind or her mind, the, their vision of America at its best, of America the beautiful, is of a vast, large, powerful, secular empire. And then picture another political figure whose vision of America at its best is an America of small communities and republics, small republics worshiping together, family units, diverse, diverse, um, diverse communities. How different will there to those two men's or women political leaders' decisions be? Because their vision is so dramatically different. The pictures that they carry in their head are so dramatically different. You know, it's not information that has given us our greatest scientific breakthroughs. Einstein himself, Einstein himself said it was his imagination that led to all his greatest breakthroughs. Not what he knew, that was essential to have, but it was imagination that led to his <clears throat> great breakthroughs. It's not knowledge that's given us the iPad or the iPod or whatever devices, the, the laptop that you have there, or the internet. Data and spreadsheets don't start businesses. They don't redeem communities. None of the great inventions and discoveries and the companies and the great leaders of the world were born on spreadsheets, but they were all born in people's imaginations. A few men in Philadelphia once imagined that they could take on the greatest empire in the world and declared independence amidst the bloody, muddy despair of the foxholes of World War I. A shy Englishman, shy little scholarly Englishman fascinated by language, imagined a world that he called Middle Earth. And now that has inspired millions upon millions of people to believe that even little shoeless, little lowly, tubby little hobbits can redeem the time. How can we do less? The founders of this university, at first to imagine an institution like it, could exist and could thrive here in Grayson. It took an act of imagination on all of your parts to believe that this is the place where you could thrive, where you could grow to become Christian leaders and successful in whatever careers that you are right now imagining, right? You have to first imagine what you will be. It's not facts that rule our world. It is not the memorization of formulas and statistics. It's not knowledge that solves our problems. It is imagination. As I've studied leadership, I have become convinced all the time more and more that the most successful men and women in this country are men and women of imagination. Where there's no vision, let me remind you, the people perish. An act of imagination is no substitute for hard work, determination, focus, and even luck. But none of those can amount to anything unless they are harnessed in the service of an imaginative vision. Leadership, at least in part, is imagining things could be different and helping others bring it about. As young Christian leaders in this age of ours, your task, your task must be to imagine that things could be different and to help others then bring it about. Change. Coming back to Edmund Burke. Change, Burke once declared, is the means of our preservation. We can afford in America today no Christianity 
that is lethargic and unimaginative. C.S. Lewis. How many of you are fans of C.S. Lewis? Chronicles of Narnia. Did you read them when you were kids? I'm sure they're over here. And this section is the perfect section to be. C.S. Lewis in The Voyage of the Dawn Treader, which is my favorite by far of those books, he introduces a new character to Narnia like this, and you remember this. There once was a boy named Eustace Clarence Scrubs, and he almost deserved it. Remember that? It's a great line. If any of you have a name like Eustace Clarence Scrubs, I hope you don't deserve it. I hope... um, Lewis understood that the best way to come to know someone is to understand what exists in their imaginations, if they have an imagination at all. And much of our imaginations are influenced by the books that we read and the books that we do not read. The greatest leaders I have known and I have learned about, and this may be surprising to you, But the greatest leaders I have learned, that I have known about, and I have known many, in military, in business, in government, in academe, are all, have all been great readers. I have the great benefit of the McConnell Center uh, interacting with, um, I've interacted with uh, uh, everyone from senators to presidents, the vice presidents, to uh, secretaries of this, that, and the other. Secretary of Defense Leon Panetta uh, will be visiting with us on March the 1st. And one of the things I can tell you about is that almost to a person, almost to a person, even political leaders that I guarantee you think are stupid, read rings around anybody in this room, except for Dr. Coleman. I have been astounded by what I have learned to be in the company of these people. Men and women who live such busy lives, you cannot imagine they even read their own mail, often, very often, turn out to be the most voracious consumers (coughs) of books. But back to Narnia. So of this character, Eustace Clarence Scrubs, Lewis wrote, and I quote, He liked books. If they were books of information and had pictures of grain elevators or of fat foreign children doing exercises in model schools. When Scrubs enters Narnia, do you remember how, where he shows up? He shows, well, he shows up in the water with, uh, with him, but then he shows up in particular in the key moment in a dragon's lair. Do you remember that? He shows up in a dragon's lair. And Lewis says this, Most of us know what we should expect to find in a dragon's lair But as I said before, Lewis wrote, Eustace had read only the wrong books. They had a lot to say about exports and imports and government and drains, but they were weak on dragons. Eustace, in other words, Lewis is telling us, had an impoverished imagination. He knew a lot of things. He failed to have the imagination necessary to interact in the world. When I was a college student like you, one of the reasons I like to talk to college students like this is I was Eustace Clarence Scrubs. I loved books of facts and fat foreign children doing exercises. I didn't know I liked that. Um, but I liked, I liked books of facts. I thought they were the most important things in the world. And they are important. But facts and figures do not rule the world. They are mere tools in the hands of those who have imaginations that allow them to be put to use. As young Christian leaders, you must come to understand the power of imagination. You must come to understand the power of your imagination, and you must understand the operation of the imaginations that you will encounter and that you will attempt to lead. You must exercise your imagination. You must do it in the right ways, with the right literature, and the right role models. You really must read biography, and history, and imaginative literature. If you can't imagine a Narnia, 
If you can't imagine a Middle Earth or a Paralandra or a Hogwarts, how can you imagine an alternative to this world of noise and boredom? If you can live only in the present for momentary desires and whims, lunch perhaps, instead of coming to hear a brilliant lecture. <laughs> how can you look for your, own, for your own future? Much less, how can you look out and make prudent decisions for future generations? Future generations yet unseen, yet unborn, existing only in our imaginations. Yet. But let me take... Uh, I think this bounce down to brass tacks for a second. It's not facts. It's not facts that will grow your businesses, but imagination. It's not figures that will sell products for you, but imaginative advertising. The salvation of your community will not be found on a spreadsheet, but in your imagining a park, perhaps, or an abandoned farm now sits, or a boutique where trains used to stop in town. Your family will not be held together because of money or exotic vacations or a new house, but because you can't imagine life without them. And now we're safe. It's, uh, the camera's gone. So. Uh, you will not serve God unless you, He reigns in your imagination. And Christ gave us the foundation stones, the stories and the images necessary for building that kingdom and, and continues to inspire artists and authors down to our current hour to cut new stones from that ancient stone that ancient stone leaders are created first in the imagination and only then can they enter the world and interact with others as young christians in 2012 you face great challenges related to the moral imagination. Great challenges. Let me lay out a few. First, for yourselves, you inhabit a world where Burke's moral imagination has come under considerable assault. The forces of the enemy are numerous. They are found in your textbooks, perhaps, that twist and pervert your historic imagination. They are found in our schools and our culture. Not here mercifully, that have been busy for generations to appropriate C.S. Lewis's phrase, making men without chests. Making men without chests. Let me, uh, let me pause for a moment. Um, Lewis is, I've mentioned him several times, and he's one of my absolute mentors, particularly on, uh, on this type of, uh, uh, these types of questions. Uh, remember when I when I said read from Edmund Burke and I said the moral imagination is what the the heart owns and the understanding ratifies. Remember that the heart owns and the understanding ratifies. If you want a more contemporary explanation of this, look at a book called The Abolition of Man by C.S. Lewis, and it's a tiny little book. Maybe I don't know, 100 pages, less than 100 pages. It's absolutely of the first rate importance understanding what I'm saying today, understanding the challenges that you face in this world that you're going to inhabit when you leave this place. Absolutely, absolutely essential. The abolition of man. And if you want to see, if you want to read a fictional exploration of it, read his book, That Hideous Strength. Anyone read any of his space novels? Two, three people, four people? Excellent. That Hideous Strength is my, probably my favorite book. It's close to my favorite book. Um, it's a space novel. It, it's supposedly never going to space. It's sort of science fiction. But it's Lewis reflecting on some of these very questions and putting them into a piece of fiction. And he plays with this, making the modern world making men without chests. And there's a very powerful image where these, the bad people, and I won't tell you too much about that, they're actually called the nice people, N-I-C-E, in the book, but uh, where the people he, he's trying to get us, warning us against, um, create, take this, take this man and they cut his body off. They take his head and they cut the skull cap out and they feed all kind of chemicals into his brain and they hook up the brain, the head, to keep it alive. And then all these chemicals and hormones and stuff allow the brain to grow and grow and grow. 
right? He's trying to tell us something, though. Get the image. Head alone, without the chest. You see this? Without the chest, without the imagination. Growing reason to, exploding reason to an unnatural uh, degree. It's a great book, and, uh, and you really should. Uh, just, it's fun. Take time to uh, read it at some point. As Burke said, what the heart owns and the understanding ratifies. Maybe we could talk about that if you want to in a little bit. It's the same vision that Plato basically had um, <clears throat> many, many, many hundreds of years before, th- a couple thousand years before. Um, in his metaphor, Lewis, that I'm getting at here, Lewis finds, or this metaphor, Lewis finds the chest to be the home of Burke's moral imagination, of proper sentiments and moral prejudices. Our culture seeks to shrink our chest to strip away the sentiments that would guide our actions toward the true and the beautiful, to remove the Christological image. The St. Crispin's Day speech of Henry V, the awful head of Medusa, the heroism of Perseus, have all been replaced by math and science, math and science, math and science. The moral testing of historic figures and events has been replaced by blind desire for scientific and medical progress and what I'll call the arrogance of the present. What Lewis called chronological snobbery. Chronological snobbery. And so I urge you to read those two books that I just said as part of your building your shield of imagination here today. And another challenge. You live in an age where those you seek, you will have to seek to lead, are confused at best, about what Christianity is, particularly a non-secularized, small-o, orthodox type of Christianity. And at worst, they might have already turned away because of the pictures that they have in their own imagination. And another challenge, you will face people who are like Dr. Johnson's bull. Dr. Samuel Johnson, he told a story of a bull, and the bull said, here's the cow and here's the grass. What more what, what, what can I ask? Well, Christian leaders must call us to higher aims than the service of our animal instincts and our pocketbooks or our bellies, Mark, and lunch. <laughs> our sentiments must be properly tuned. The pictures that we carry with us must be appropriate to encourage us to actions that are courageous and kind and generous and full of humility. We must imagine love and not the buying and selling of goods to be their proper end. We must imagine the happy death, the happy death of a servant to be our great reward and not the earthly treasures that will pass away. In other words, we must, we must strive to have moral imagination. And we must enact its teachings. For on this campus and in your communities, when you take up the standard of Christian leadership, you must keep constantly in your mind that you are representative now of bigger things, bigger things than yourself. Your actions may be the primary informant of what Christianity is for the imaginations of those you encounter. You may be the most important book they ever read. And in any event, your actions will enter their imaginations and may well become the basis upon which they judge the ideas you care for, the organizations you support, and the God that you serve. Keep your image in your, this image, I hope, in your mind. Let it inhabit and inform your imaginations. This image of you being a book, of your actions forming the chapters of that book, of your words forming the pages. And that image, I hope, if you let it enter as a picture, one of these pictures that you carry around with you, may help you keep on the straight and narrow, may help you act right in times of trouble and temptation. I hope. I pray. Thank you for listening to me. I'm going to stop there and see if you have any questions or thoughts or arguments or what have you. Thank you for listening.
questions? questions, thoughts? Or if not, if you just want to, you just love listening to me, I can continue on through the rest of my speech, but talk. Thoughts, concerns, questions, worries, upset. You're still sitting there thinking, God, I'm the only stupid person in the room. I don't understand what this moral imagination thing is. I understand it. Yeah, go ahead. Um, as an admissions counselor, um, one of the things that um, you're trying to be imperative is to think past your shirt, mm-hmm. Kentucky Christian University. Yeah, right. And to um, you know ask questions correctly. But I, it, this talk got me thinking about even more so about um, how we as Christians need to be asking questions, maintaining the, the clear picture of truth of Christ. I yep. mean, would you agree with that? Can you expound a little bit about that? Yeah, absolutely. I really do think. Again, go back. To, well, let's start with your admissions thing. You're absolutely right. This is just this is just a perfect example of how almost everything you're going to do, if you're going to be successful in it, it's going to require imagination. A good admissions officer is someone who has the imagination to. I'm 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 thinking on the fly here, but it seems to me imagining what's in that student, potential student's mind. If you if you can imagine what's in their mind, then you can paint the right picture, answer the right questions. Uh, et cetera, that you have to do. Imagine what will be attractive. I mean, I, I talked to uh, one of you today said you came because there was a brochure or something in your camp, in your Christian camp that you went to. Well, someone had to imagine what would be on that paper that would attract you to that, right? It, it really is imagination. Um, it's absolutely key to it. Now, you talked about being a, uh, being a Christian. I, I really do think, and, and Lewis, the abolition of man, is really good about this, is if you read that and study, study that, really seriously think on it, it's partly about natural law. It's partly about uh, the truth of, um, of the values and virtues that we, that we as Christians believe in. And he tries to show that they are, uh, if you don't know this book, he tries to show that they are, in part, this is part of it, um, that they are found in many cultures throughout the world. And so he's trying to point to the natural law truth of it. But you can't get through reason. Um, you can't get through reason, but you get through some other faculty trying to get at you. And that's sort of this chess stuff. Um, yes, people react to the pictures that you, that you put in front of them. And if you are going to be a, uh, if you're going to be a Christian leader, or I mean, a Christian at all, frankly, you will be a leader because when someone out there sees you acting, they're going to tag it with your, your, your religion. And so if you're out there and you're doing something heinous and terrible, they'll say, well, look, that's what Christianity is, right? Um, we have to, uh, we really have to invite Christ into our, into our hearts, take those pictures from, that he teaches with, very seriously, and, and then ask ourselves, how, what pictures are we projecting? I'm not sure I'm, I'm answering the question, I'm trying to fumble around it again, but what, I guess this, all of us can ask this question, what what picture are we projecting to the world? Um, it's absolutely essential. Yeah, absolutely. If, if, well, where we go often go wrong is reasoning people into arguments. People usually aren't reasoned into arguments. Sometimes they are. Sometimes we are. We, we react to reason. Um, but very often, it's not that. It's the heart that comes out. It's the heart. And there may be a reason. Lewis, Lewis thinks there's a reason that in the 20th century our educational establishment our political establishment, um, particularly our education establishment, he said, tried to remove remove the heart, remove the chest, create men without chest. Yeah. Do you have some suggestions for exercises to strengthen our imagination? Read anything that I've ever written and keep <laughs> buying the books as they come out. That would be an excellent one. Um, I really think once you get th- th- this... It doesn't, all, it doesn't completely operate this way. I hope what I've done, but I hope what I've done is created pictures in all of your heads so that you're conscious of it now. Once you're conscious of it, you're going to see it everywhere. If you take this seriously, if I've made any impact on you today, you're going to pick up a book and you're going to read it and you're going to think about it. And you're gonna, it's going to become more part of who you are because you're seeing it. Or you're going to be warned. You're going to see some commercial on TV or a movie or something and say, wow, What's this doing to my imagination? What's it, I just gathered this little picture in here. What is it doing in, in my head? Um, and you're going to start thinking about it. Or people you're reacting with, you're interacting with. You're going to start asking those kind of questions of, you know, to yourself of them. 
And once you're, once you're cognizant of it, I think that's part of, you're, you're going to exercise yourself because anything you read, anything you see, it's going to be part of it. Now, beyond that, I really do think the, the, the key is imaginative literature, frankly. Um, if you're going to be, a, if you're going to be a political leader, that's your goal. I think you have to read biography. You have to read history. No question about it. I know Dr. Coleman. I'm sorry. You have to read some history. Biography is absolutely essential. Um, but imaginative literature is, um, man, it's where it's at. I think, uh, it's, it's, it's really where it's at. The, um, and you could go Lewis, all of Lewis's stuff, of course, fabulous. I'm doing a study right now of my with my students. We're doing the Lord of the Rings, um, and I'm sure Dr. Coleman will sit around with you and talk Lord of the Rings if you're interested at some point. Would you, Dr. Coleman? Always, Always. see that uh, Sam Wise Gamgee himself back there said that. Um, the uh, and we're doing Lord of the Rings, and you know Tolkien. If you don't know Tolkien, Tolkien was uh, where C.S. Lewis was um, Orthodox Protestant. Lewis was a uh, very serious Catholic. And uh, there's a book called, if, you, if you're interested in exploring that, called um, J.R. Tolkien's Sanctifying Myth. There's numerous books about finding God in Tolkien. But um, that's by a dear friend of mine, Brad Burzer, and I, I'd suggest it. Um, but you, you read, read Lord of the Rings now thinking about this. Man, you're going to see incredible images in, that, that, he, that, that Tolkien is trying to, trying to share with us. Um, they're not, it's not reasoning, it's, it's, it's the images. It's the images of Frodo, of Samwise picking up his friend Frodo, you know. And if you if that you let that image of Frodo being carried up the side of Mount Doom, you got a friend in need. You're gonna pick him up, you know. You're gonna pick her up. I hope. So read lot, anything, Lewis. I mean, I love Tolkien stuff. There's a lot of great literature out there right now. Um, Shoot, I, I had a I had a important brainstorm. Um, Dr. Coleman would probably say read the Sporan, right, Absolutely. or the Iona Conspiracy. Those are my two Absolutely. books. Um, <laughs> um, I think I think read. You know, movies movies help, but I think what here's the, here's the difference between movie and that's what I'm going to say. The difference between watching a movie and reading a book, watching the movie and reading, or um, or, or a book, the Bible, whatever you want to read, is. They, reading forces us, reading forces us to make the mental pictures ourselves. This is huge. Makes the mental pictures ourselves. How much deeper is that than embedded in who we are if we create the images? You know, every one of you just had a picture when I talked to, whoever's paying attention to me, when I talked about Samwise carrying Frodo up the side of Mount Doom, you were creating that picture in your head, I hope. Well, you might be getting it from the movies now. Uh, darn it. Um, when I gave you that picture of that head, which that has not been in the movies yet, they haven't made hideous, that hideous strength, they should, but when I gave you the picture of that head swollen, the reason, swollen to gargantuan size out of normal, you had to create that in your head. That's going to be more of a part of you. Um, and it's going gonna, it's gonna to be ready to be tapped in when you need it. The, uh, when you watch a movie, two things happen. One is you are getting a picture that is being implanted very directly by the movie director. Number two, it, it is passive. It's just floating in, right? Uh, it's not really part of you, though, of course, we remember these things. But number two is movies have the, um, the danger. It's not danger. I watch movies, too. But the problem between movies and a book is movies are continuous and in control of you. If you read a book, you get an image, you can stop. You stop at that image and you think. Wonder. What's that telling me? What's that getting? It's getting part of me now. What is this? What's going on? You can stop and you can think and, um, and you can make it your own. Tolkien talks about this in his, in his essay on fairy stories, which is really fabulous, um, where he talks about appropriation. And great literature is there to be appropriated. Here's another thing I'll say about that. Don't, don't ask this question necessarily. We do because it's fun and we sort of have to. And... Um, it's less important what the author means than what you appropriate, what you make it mean, how you make it live in your, in your own world, you know? Um, and I can say from somebody that's written, you know, a couple of novels, I will tell you I wrote things that I did not intend to mean what I think they do mean, probably. And I know I didn't intend 
Um, when I write, write passages, write, uh, you know, create scenes, I know they mean things because I've heard them from people. I'll give you a quick example of it. Um, that they mean different things to other people as they appropriated it. Quick example of that. So anyway, I say it's less important what, what you think an author thought. It's more important what you, how you use it. Um, I wrote in my first novel. Um, after my first novel came out, I got an email from a guy, um, a reader, who said, um, Isaiah chapter 10, verse 21. That's all it said. Oh, no, it said... Well, it said, I just got done reading your sporran. And then he put that, your book. Uh, and then he put that. Um, so I was out taking a walk at that point. I said, what about that? What, what is that? I couldn't wait to get home. So I got home and hooked up the Bible. And, and that verse is, a, a remnant uh, a remnant from the house of Jacob shall return to the one true God. Well, my lead character is named Jacob. My series is called The Remnant Chronicles. And he was offering that I am that my Jacob is will be heading in the future here to the return to the one to the one true God. I didn't intend that. I don't know how it happened. I get shivers up my you know my back when I think about it. It's less important what I meant by that, if that makes sense. It's more important that he meant. But he could bring his imagination to this and he could bring his knowledge to this. And it means something different to him. And it means something different to me now too of what I've got going on. Any other questions, comments, whatever? Yeah, we've gone a long time. Uh, another shame is book for your book, but um, what inspired you to write these books? Because my, my cousin is, re- is reading them now, and I guess that means I have some too. Um, yes, you do. <laughs> but what inspired you to write them? I mean, and my, what um, did you want to teach to readers? Um, it's a pretty neat moment, I actually, that is. Uh, the quick story is um, I was a political scientist, I was used to Clarence Scrubs. And I didn't care anything about anything except facts and figures. I thought they were the most important thing in the world. Um, until I really got inspired in the last decade of my life, or, or less, um, and I started figuring out it's really this imaginative literature that's important. Um, this is really the important thing. Um, I, I was on a trip in Scotland. So my books take place, take place in Scotland. Started in the United States, take place in Scotland. I was a trip, uh, on a trip, a student trip in Scotland. We're traveling around Scotland. And I bought a sporran. Anybody know what a sporran is? Now, a quick Scottish lesson. Sporran is a little pouch that you guys see a guy with a bagpipe or bagpipes and a, a kilt on. I have my kilt that I have on. And so it's a little pouch that goes in the front. And of course, there's no pockets in a kilt, and so you need a pouch. And so um, it's got, that's called a sporran. So I bought a kilt and a sporran um, and knee socks and stuff when I was over there. And I came home. And my mother was visiting, and uh, so I put on my kilt and my sparrow. And uh, my mother just like rolling around. I was like, oh, come on, please, kid. What kind of kid have I raised, this weirdo? Um, and my little son, Landon, who was four years old at the time, Landon came wa- walking over to me, and he had a little, uh, you know, those little plastic darts that you guys probably play with, a little suction cup at the end? Um, he had one of those. And he walked over to me, he lifted the flap on my, on my sparrow, and dropped the, uh, dropped the dart in and walked away. That was it. What that caused me, the spark in my mind, in my imagination, uh, of a, I got a picture. And the picture was of that little dart disappearing. And that was it. I started, um, it, it, just, it stuck with me. It bothered me. Uh, I have a, a friend who is a novelist that said, uh, uh, described it this way, the feeling. He said, uh, you know, you get, you get like a little, little bit of sand stuck in your oyster. A little sand stuck in your oyster. That's what it was for me. A little sand stuck in there. That thing disappearing. I never thought I would write a, uh, certainly not a young adult book. I thought maybe I'd write a novel at some point in my life. Certainly not a young adult book. Certainly not kind of fancy, fantasy kind of thing. Um, but, um, so I sat down and I said, well, this is stuck. I'm going to, I got to figure out why it disappeared. Why did this thing disappear? So I created uh, three characters, Jacob, Will, and Jenny. Um, and I said, Jacob and Will, well, I sent the three of them down my street on a bike. And, uh, I don't know, 700 published pages later and probably another 5,000 to go. Um, and, uh, and the whole thing started to unravel. It is much like, um, this is exactly this, this, this is exactly the process C.S. Lewis used. Exactly. Is he would get pictures in his head. The whole Chronicles of Narnia, if you don't know this, is what, it's seven books? The whole Chronicles of Narnia started when he got a picture in his head. Again, go back to the same thing I'm talking about here. Pictures in your head. When he got a picture in his head of a uh, of a fawn in a snowstorm 
uh, carrying an umbrella and packages, which is just weird. Think about that. Just weird. There was no Aslan. There was no bigger story. It was the picture. And he sat down and decided to write about it. What is this thing? Um, and then he says the same thing for Aslan. You know, Aslan's the Christ figure in the books. Aslan just came bounding into his dream, which he actually says at one point it was a nightmare. He came bounding into his into his dream, his picture, and his head, the picture, and uh, and entered the books at that point, and everything changes from that. How many of our worlds have changed uh, because of that? So anyway, that's where that's where it all came from. Uh, it's been the most fun, most enjoyable thing I've ever done, um, frankly. Uh, and I think probably the most important, because I'm, uh, I hope, I pray that I am uh, putting good pictures and not bad pictures in people's heads that they'll carry around with them. Now you know what a sparring is, so if you got nothing out of this lecture beyond that, you know what a sparring is. If you were in Scotland, you'd probably say, sparring. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I think, we'll, oh, uh, we had, do, I guess we take one more question. I'll see Dr. Gerber's hands up. Oh, uh, I'm sure it was question. <laughs> Part of the problem, night, man. I'm here all night. Part of the problem of preaching is putting a picture in people's minds. You have an idea that suggests that people are heading down that road? Youth ministry, teaching classes, whatever. That's exactly what it's about. Absolutely. I mean, the, you can't you can't completely put aside reason. You can't completely put it aside. You can't completely put aside memorization, remembering facts and verses, etc. But it is, I am fully convinced, it is the pictures that you send. If you're if you're in youth ministry or if you're going to if you're going to be a preacher, it, man, it is absolutely the pictures you put in the people's heads, your congregation's heads, that are going to determine their life. No question about it. Um, I mean, Christ understood that. Christ talked, it's taught in parables. Right? This is this is not. I'm not a genius here to come up with this. This is this is the history of the of of, of the West, um, and it's certainly Christ uh, is leading us this way teaching us how to do this. The question then is how you care. generate the picture that's appropriate to what you're trying to say. Yeah, well, Just that's... Lay awake um, at night or what? <laughs> <laughs> uh, you wait for them to come bounding in. You just sit there and... Uh, I'm actually in a, uh, a little bit of a funk writing right now because the pictures aren't bounding in at all. I'm just sort of stuck there. Um, but that's okay. They'll come when they're, when they're supposed to come. Uh, um, I think the way you ge- the way you generate is to uh, is the way you do anything else. is, is you pray... And you feed your your imagination as much as you can. I mean, the more stuff you have in your imagination, the more pictures in there, the more one's gonna, the more likelihood you're gonna have one that's gonna be uh, useful at any moment to be able to pull out. Um, I mean, just think think about this. It's the um, Lewis talks about this as he says in the Abolition of Man. He says um, he asks this question: What causes a man, a soldier, what causes a soldier to dive on a grenade? Yeah. Okay. And so what? 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 What part of what would cause him to do that? He asks this. He says, "Is it reasonable? It's not reasonable action to dive onto a grenade and and kill yourself. Is it? Re- is does it? If we have three parts of our soul, which is what Plato talks about, like think of your your soul as a um, as a as a snowman, as as reason." This chest, what we talked about, moral imagination, and then your belly, when you when you were called that he heated that call to go for lunch today, you know, that's that big part. And I understand it, man. Mark, we're we're here together because we all have. That's the biggest part of all of our souls, you know. That is the biggest part. That belly part. That that animal instinct part, right? Um. Anyway, that was distracting. Okay, but what you have for lunch, I'm wondering. Uh, what could have driven you there? Uh, so that's the biggest part. And what um, I'm completely lost now. Why am I a snowman? Why am I talking about snowman? Plato's yeah, chariot. Plato's chariot. Yeah, yeah. Well, exactly. I'm getting yeah. If you know Plato's chariot, that's absolutely. Why would a man jump on a grenade? Yeah, why would a man jump on a grenade? Thank you. So it's not the reason, um, and it's not it's not the belly either. You know, it's not it's that your animal instincts tell you to survive, right? It's not that. It's got to be something else. And what Lewis says is this: it's the chest. It's the pictures of sacrificial love. It's the pictures of friendship. It's Christ maybe hanging from the cross and knowing he died for us and, and acting that. Um, that's what moves people, you know, and uh, in, in the crisis moments. You don't have to think. You got it in here. You know it. Those pictures. 
So be careful. Read, uh, read. Uh, be careful what you read. Except read anything that your professors tell you, of course. Be careful what you read. But man, read, read, read. Study. Um, be good. Have fun. Thanks for waiting. Thanks for being here with me. We'll give Sorry Dr. Take so long. a round of applause. Yeah. Yeah.